Good morning, Shoreline. My name is James and service is about to start. Here's what you need to know. Parents, we have kids services happening every single weekend. From babies to fifth graders, there is a special place just for them to have fun and learn about Jesus. Right now, you can head over to the lobby and go to the kids' check-in to get signed in. And we also have the family room available at any point during the service. For all our middle school and high school students, we have a service just for you. There, you can build incredible friendships and learn what it means to follow Jesus. You can head over to the lobby right now to get checked in and join your service. If it's your first time today, we are so glad that you joined us for service. We pray that you leave here today knowing God better, and we would love to connect with you. The best way to do that is by scanning the QR code right there at your seat. There you can fill out a connect card and find all the resources to learn more about Shoreline. It's about that time. Let's stand together and get ready to worship. Good morning, Shoreline. Come on, let's give God some praise in this place. Let's go. Come on, if you're glad he's in the room, make some noise. Here we go, here we go. I'm not forsaken, never.
some noise in this place. We speak Jesus over your life today. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break
that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem and they took palm branches and went out to meet him shouting Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord blessed is the king of Israel you know we've got some pastor friends that many years ago built some homes in India to reach out to those in need and they just got back from there and we were talking about it and she said we call each one of these homes house of palms and she said we do that because the palm tree represents victory and if you look at the palm tree they grow in arid climates where they overcome the drought they keep on standing when the hurricane force winds come throughout the coastal areas the palm tree keeps on standing you know deborah who was one of the judges of israel she sat underneath a palm tree and she received strategy from the lord on how to overcome the enemies how to be victorious the palm tree stands for victory even victory over death and so when jesus came riding into jerusalem on that day and people were fanning their palms it was as if they were declaring that the king of glory was coming to ride into their lives with victory for every single area of their lives and you know what sometimes it feels like we're just in a crowd of people and we wonder if god is like looking at us he sees us he knows what's going on but honestly you guys if you know the lord you know he sees you he does know you and he really has victory for every single area of your life and so it's just an amazing thing to me that we can cry out to him just like these people cried out and he will come to save us with victory he'll come riding into our lives to help us raise our kids he'll come riding into our lives with victory over sickness and disease and every single thing joel can attest to that god is a victorious god he will come riding to us when we are down he will bring peace he will bring joy he will bring life he will bring freedom he will come riding to us in whatever way that we have need of and so today i want you to just open up your heart to the king of victory and let him ride triumphantly into your life father we thank you that you are a god of victory that you overcame death hell and the grave that you sent jesus to die for our sins so that by those stripes we would be healed that we would be victorious over every single thing that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy in our lives. Father, we thank you that we are not just out there somewhere. Father, that you didn't just do miracles for people back then or the people around us, but you do miracles for us today. Father, we proclaim you as victorious in our lives in every way. In Jesus' name and everybody's name. Amen. 
where there should be a casket The children are singing and dancing and laughing The Father is welcoming, this is our homecoming Roses in bloom, pushed up from the embers And rivers of tears flow from good times remembered Families are singing and dancing and laughing The Father is welcoming to have you guys here this morning and it's good to have Krista back with us. She's uh, typically down south these days, but it's wonderful to have you up yes. north with us as well. Good morning, Shoreline. We are so glad that you're here. Yeah, like Pastor Yuri said, I am at our south campus. If you didn't know, we do have an amazing, awesome south campus um, down at all the way to the south part of Austin. So if you know anyone in the area, we would love to worship together with them. You guys are welcome to take your seats at this point in time. And then if there's any youth in the room, you guys are welcome to head out as well to your right. Uh, if you head out those doors, there's a special service especially for you. And I want to take a moment just to welcome anybody that is visiting us for the first time today. So whether you're online or right here in the room, we are so glad you came and we would love to hear from you today. Uh, yeah, let's give them a hand. We're really grateful that you've come to visit us today and we've got a special gift for you in the lobby. There's a QR code that you can scan or that Connect card right in front of you in the seat back uh, in front of you. You can fill that in and we'd love to hear from you and meet you today if you're visiting us for the first time. Yeah, and if you've been coming for a while and you're ready to take that next step to get connected, that QR code or that Connect card is also for you. You can just fill it out. You can get connected um, with serving, with groups. That next step for you is to take our dive in class, which is just an awesome time to connect with other um, people here at Shoreline and just get a glimpse of the vision and where we're headed and how you play a part in it. So we'd love to invite you to take that next step to get connected. So there's a couple of different ways that you can give at Shoreline. You can go to shoreline.net slash give, scan the QR code in your armrest, or use the envelope right in front of you and give into the bucket when it comes by. But I wanna share something with you about the purpose of our giving, what we accomplish through our giving. So the book of Romans chapter 10 and verse 14 says this. It says, how will they call on Him if they do not believe? And how will they believe if they haven't heard? And how will they hear if nobody tells them. And what I love about this verse is there's a couple of impossibles and then it gets to a possible, right? So it says, how can they call on Him if they don't believe? We can't make them believe, right? And then it says, but how can they believe unless they hear? We can't even make them hear. How many of you have teenagers? They choose to hear, right? Okay. Hearing is a choice. So the first thing is the Holy Spirit's got to make them believe. They've got to choose to hear. 
But the third thing in this verse, that's something we can do. We can tell them, okay? We get to tell them and they might hear and He might convict them and they might know who He is and they might call on Him. And that is what we do together. That is why we exist as a church. We exist as a church so that we might tell them. We're gathering here together today. We're broadcasting online today. Why? So that we might tell the city who He is, who the one is that is faithful for them to call on. And that is what we're giving into today. We're giving into an opportunity to tell them. Tell them through Easter. Tell them through every service that we're together. So thank you for participating in telling them so that they might hear and believe and call on Him. Lord, I pray that every little bit of our giving today, Father, every contribution that is made, every sacrificial giving that takes place, every faithfulness in tithing that people participate in today. Lord, I pray that you will take all of it and Lord, may we speak Jesus to our city and to the mountains and to the streets and to every person in our city together with the resources that you provide in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And ushers, you can go ahead and receive our offering at this time. Guys, we have some really fun things coming up with Easter, obviously. But before we get to Easter, we have these awesome t-shirts and there's just a few left. So you'll have to get them after service today. But they go to support our single mom center. Every single May, we like to lay out the red carpet for our single moms and have a special dinner for them and honor them. And if you're a mom, you know how much that deserves some respect. And those single moms are just the heroes out there. And so... Um, let's, let's just be generous with them. And so you can get a t-shirt out in the lobby. And the really cool thing about these shirts is the back of it has all of our Easter invite information on it. So it's like a walking advertisement as you're out and about this week to invite people to Easter at Shoreline. So you can get that out in the lobby after service today. It's exciting. It's one week, one week, and then it's Easter. Okay. So I want everybody to grab their phones real quick. Okay. Get your phone out, go to your texting app. Okay, and when you go to your texting app, this is what I want you to do is I want you to think of a couple of people that you can text right now and invite them to Easter next week. Okay, it's a week out. This is your opportunity. You might just get a cool gift back like that. Okay, but you've got to invite some people. Okay, so grab your phone. Shoreline.net slash invite is what you want to put in there with a personalized message. Who do you know whose life might be about to change as they encounter Jesus? Who do you know who has God brought over your path lately that that might just be waiting for an invitation in order for them to show up for Easter next week? Send those text messages. You can grab a card on the way out and then wear your Easter t-shirt all week long as you are a living, walking, breathing billboard for Easter next Sunday. So good. It is really going to be such a special service. And the best way that someone is going to join you is with an invitation to sit right next to you. So make sure you're doing that this week. It's going to be so special. And to get a little um, excitement in the air for what's coming up with Easter, why don't you go ahead and check this out and then enjoy the rest of the service today. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? We want to give a huge uh, shout out to all of you who are watching online from around the community, around the city, around the state, even in some cases around the world. And also joining us right now is our Shoreline South congregation. So come on, let's give it up for Shoreline South and our online congregation. We love you guys so very much. Let's all of us stand to our feet. While you're standing, I wanted to let you know that there's an incredible group of people that make ministry happen here at Shoreline every single week. 
and that is our three team. We call them our three team because they help us accomplish the mission of the church, which is to help people know God, find life, and make a difference. And uh, we love all of the people that serve. We love all of you, but there is a very special place in our hearts for those who take that extra step and use their gifts and talents to make a difference. And I just wanted to encourage all of you with Good Friday coming up this Friday night and uh, Easter coming up next weekend, there are more opportunities for people to serve. And if you want to be a part of the three team, even if it's just for Easter, uh, we wanna encourage you uh, to, to, you can just go to shoreline.net backslash serve or talk to somebody in the lobby after service. We would love um, to have you uh, be a part of what's taking place uh, next weekend. All right, we're gonna do our Shoreline Creed. This is the way we start every single service. Uh, it's just a declaration of the fact that what we celebrate over and above the incredible principles and ideas that the Bible speaks on how to live your best life, we celebrate the beauty of God's grace. And we do that together uh, as we uh, say the creed. Uh, if you're new to Shoreline, please feel free to read along. The rest of us, we say this with some enthusiasm and passion. You guys ready? Yes. Okay, here we go. I am loved by God. I cannot earn it. I cannot lose it. I am forgiven and made brand new. In Christ, I live with passion and purpose. I am empowered by the Spirit to be the church in the world and to live this love revolution. Come on, let's give God praise for that. All right, you may be seated. Uh, I'm lucky to be standing before you here this morning uh, because I almost got run over this week by a member of our own congregation. I was having lunch with my lovely wife and I walked out of the restaurant and almost got run over by someone who was distracted. I won't mention any names, Amy sitting right here on the front row. Security, keep an eye on her. You know that today is Palm Sunday, and this particular event in the church calendar records Jesus riding on a donkey from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. It's recorded in all four of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but I just want to read to you out of the book of Luke. So Luke's account of this uh, particular event. And I just wanna preface what I'm saying here today that eventually what we're going to uh, kind of embrace this morning is an, an opportunity for our worship to become more authentic, okay? So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we go through this uh, story together. And I hope there'll be some freshness and maybe some insight that you've never considered before that at the end of the day, uh, both for our online congregation, South congregation, and all of us here together, uh, that we would be more authentic in our, in our worship. This particular story in Luke uh, is found in chapter 19, and I'm just gonna kind of read it, so hang with me as we go through this particular story. After telling this story, Jesus went on towards Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. And as he came to the town of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples ahead, go into the village over there. And as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you uh, why you are untying the colt, just say, the Lord needs it. And I just want to pause for a moment because I, I really want you to focus in on that phrase, the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, oh, why are you untying the colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it and he, uh, for him to ride. And as he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. And when he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all of the wonderful miracles that they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. In Matthew and Mark, 
it records that they shouted Hosanna, which means save now. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. In the message translation, it says it this way, if they keep quiet, the stones would do it for them, shouting praise. All right. So Easter is the greatest celebration of victory ever. And Palm Sunday kind of kicks off this incredible um, season of events that literally changes the world. And I, I kind of feel like it's uniquely designed this way by God that this particular celebration of Easter happens in the spring where it seems like all of creation is worshiping the Lord. And if you ever wondered, you know, the ethnicity of God, you know, he's a Texan. Because in Texas, we get these incredible wildflowers that blossom at this time of the year, all of them painting a beautiful picture. And I think giving glory to God. There are red flowers and yellow flowers and blue flowers. The blue bonnets, come on, how many of you like the blue bonnets? Let me see your hands. Yeah, they're awesome. And they're in bloom right now. Uh, everybody goes crazy over these, over these flowers. Uh, from time to time, the, the, uh, the bikers uh, here at Shoreline will gather together and they'll go for a ride out in the hill country. And, uh, and, and if it happens in the spring, it's always about, let's go see the, the flowers. And I think it's kind of funny that these biker dudes with leather jackets are interested in flowers probably never think about flowers any other time of the year, but riding a motorcycle, any excuse will do. We're gonna go see the flowers. But also the opposite is true. People who don't like motorcycles uh, tend to get on motorcycles to see the flowers. And, and that perfectly describes Laura. She doesn't like motorcycles. She doesn't wanna ride on a motorcycle. I bought a motorcycle so that we could romantically ride together, but she never wants to go anywhere other than a few miles to a barbecue unless the wild flowers are in bloom, unless the blue bonnets can be seen. Then she gets on the motorcycle. And, uh, and I've got a picture to prove it. I want you to see, this is uh, Laura and I seeing the blue bonnets. Wow. Isn't she beautiful? And Laura is kind of cute too. <laughs> Christmas heralds the beginning of the battle between God and the enemy to eradicate the effects of the fall on mankind. And Easter is the celebration of the culmination of God's plan to victoriously reclaim us back as his sons and daughters. And right before Easter, we have Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday kicks it all off. And there is a massive crowd that's gathered as Jesus begins to ride into Jerusalem. I was kind of wanting to impress you with a number that there were like 100,000 people, but I kind of pulled that out of thin air. I knew that there was a couple of hundred thousand people that, that lived in Jerusalem. Uh, and, uh, and so I figured since the whole city was stirred up that maybe 100,000 came out to, to see Jesus walking, uh, riding on that donkey into Jerusalem. But as I researched it, I found out that my numbers were way off because what I didn't account for 
is that this was Holy Week and there were an additional 2 million people in Jerusalem on that day. We know from antiquity documented uh, facts that there were 265,000 lambs that were slain uh, on that week that Jesus was riding into Jerusalem. They've got a document that proves that. Historians say that normally a lamb would cover about 10 individuals. So in Jerusalem, that particular day, there were 2,650,000 approximately people that had gathered from all around the region to be a part of Jerusalem. And since the whole city was in an uproar around Jesus riding into Jerusalem, that 100,000 number is probably a gross underestimation. Maybe it was even 10 times as many. Maybe even a million people were gathered there as Jesus was riding into Jerusalem. Our King, our Lord, our master. But there is something really different about this particular king because there is no arrogance. There is no boastfulness. There is no celebrity status. He's a humble king riding on a donkey. And it must have been a little bit amusing to see a man who was every bit, if not larger in size than the, than the donkey he was riding on. Have you ever seen a donkey maybe at a petting zoo or, or, or you know, a children's carnival? They're not very prestigious animals. They're small. And here is Jesus riding on a donkey. If the motivation of Jesus was to try to project power and authority, he was going about it all wrong. He's riding on a donkey. This is not the president of the United States with 30 security guards, uh, cars in front and another 30 behind. And then, you know, the, the armored limousine with the flags uh, kind of rushing into town. This is not that. This is not a celebrity helicoptering in, you know, with the awe of people. This is not a Roman emperor. You've seen the movies where they have hundreds and hundreds, thousands upon tens of thousands of soldiers marching in lockstep. Hitler used to do that to project this power. He would have all of his soldiers and they would you know, use you know, that kind of hand motion uh, to project power and allegiance. This is not that. This is our king, but he's riding on a donkey. And the motivation behind why he was riding on a donkey is recorded in Zechariah chapter nine and verse nine. It says, rejoice greatly. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble riding on a donkey. The reason he's on a donkey is because our King, our Lord, our Master, our Savior is humble in heart. Now, there's a little bit of a unique um, paradox here. You have on one side the fact that Jesus is humble riding on a donkey but please do not mistake that he doesn't know exactly who he is. He knows that he is God in the flesh. 
He knows he's the creator of the whole universe. He knows he's all powerful, all knowing, all seeing everywhere. He knows who he is. And he doesn't shy from expressing that even in the midst of his humility riding on a donkey. You don't ever get these two attributes in society. You have humble people who seem to have no power. You've got powerful people who seem to have no humility. And then you've got Jesus who is all powerful, but also humble of heart, riding on a donkey into Jerusalem. Think about this. The most powerful God moments that I have ever experienced rarely come when you're on a white stallion riding ahead of the, of the parade. The most powerful God moments in our lives are often the things that are done in secret, motivated by authenticity, sincerity, and humility. One of my really good friends pastors a church in Virginia and they were having a, a women's conference just like we do here at Shoreline. And before the, the, the women's conference, uh, Sharon, uh, our good friend, the pastor's wife was seen praying over every single chair in their multi-thousand seat auditorium, just praying. And one of the security people uh, we're, we're walking through the church and they saw, took a picture of her. No one was around, nobody knew. It wasn't organized, sincerely motivated from her heart. Just took a picture of that and they posted it on Instagram and it went viral. Sometimes the most powerful things are not the things that are done from the stage. They are things that are done behind the scenes, motivated by humility and authenticity. Maybe some of the most incredible things that will happen today will happen in the children's ministry or in the youth ministry or, or a conversation that happens after service, someone authentically communicating out of a heart of humility, grace, and God's presence. Some of you know that, that I did missionary work uh, before we, we started this church 30 plus years ago. And uh, we, uh, we traveled ar around the world. I graduated uh, from college in 1982. In 1983, we, we started, a friend of mine and I, we started an organization that was doing missionary work. We smuggled Bibles into Russia. We, uh, we traveled around the United States and gathered young people together and took them on mission trips to Central America but we also spent nearly a year of our lives in Uganda, Africa, holding crusades in different places in that war-torn country. And it was difficult, I'll be honest with you, difficult for, for, for me because we didn't have much money. And so we had just enough to buy some rice and potatoes. And that's what we ate for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner. And, uh, and after being there for a couple of weeks, I had lost so much weight that one morning my friend came up to me and he took a picture of me. I said, what are you doing? He said, we're gonna send this to your parents with a note that says for $10 a month, you could feed this poor starving child. <laughs> and I remember one time uh, going to the place where we were gonna have a meeting. We, we, we set up this wooden stage and, uh, and I got up you know, ready to, to preach and I was sick and I was tired and I was hungry and I was discouraged. And I got on the stage and all I did was I, I just said, God, this is for you. This is for you. I'm here for you. Use me any way that you can. And I, and I just winked and I winked. It was just between me and God. I just winked. And a couple of days later, let me show you a picture. I think of the... Uh, of the, yeah, this, 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 these, these are the crusades and that's me preaching. I was really handsome back then. <laughs> and, uh, and so a couple of days later, my friend who was traveling with me, he said, you know what? Out of all the things that we've ever done together, smuggling Bibles into Russia, all the great sermons you've ever preached, 
you inspired me the most a couple of days ago because I saw you wink. I saw you wink. Isn't it interesting that sometimes the most powerful things we do are the things that are motivated by authenticity behind the scenes, motivated by a humble desperation. It's in those moments that God is most glorified. So here he is riding on a donkey because he is truly humble. He's not trying to be humble. He is truly humble and he's the king and he is the Lord. He's the creator of the universe all at the same time that he's riding on this donkey into Jerusalem. And here's the point. Even though he is humble to the core, he is every bit God and he acts like it. Nobody would say the things that Jesus said that day unless he was truly God. He goes in, into Bethpage and tells his disciples, go get the donkey. And if anybody asks you why, just say the Lord has need of it. Think about how audacious that is. The Lord has need of it. Not, can we borrow it for a few hours? Not, can we rent it? Not, can we buy it? The Lord has need of it. And the people who own the donkey say, okay. The Lord has need of it. The one who created the donkey, created the world, created the village, created the people, has need of it. And that was all that Jesus had to say. I'm the creator and I need it. And that was enough. And when you think about all of the founders of the you know, most popular religions in the world, you, you, you think about Muhammad, you think you know, about Gandhi, you think about you know, uh, Moses, and then you think about Jesus. Jesus is the only one who talks and acts like he truly is God. So consider this, who besides Jesus talks like this about himself? Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not Moses, not any other leader. And consider this as well. He is completely comfortable being worshiped completely comfortable being worshiped. He's riding on a donkey. Palm branches are, are being placed in front of him, a coat, you know, on the donkey and people are worshiping him. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, King, Lord, Master. They're worshiping him. If for some strange reason, you came up to me in the lobby after service today and started worshiping me. I know none of you would feel tempted to do that, but just say, if you did, honestly, you know what I would do? I would say, well, you listen, you are completely mistaken. It's not about me. It's about him. I would do that for two reasons. One is because I really believe and know that it's all about him. And secondly, I don't wanna be struck by lightning because <laughs> I know who I am. So if somebody starts inappropriately expressing worship to me, I'm going like this. You know what Jesus is doing? People start worshiping. He starts pointing the fingers this way with humility. He's riding on a donkey but he knows that he is God and he embraces the worship of the people around him. He, he hears what the Pharisees are saying. The Pharisees say, get your people under control. 
But you don't hear Jesus saying, hey guys, I'm sorry, my followers are getting a little bit out of hand. He doesn't say that. He doesn't turn around and say, hey, we don't wanna give people the wrong impression. No, he says the most audacious thing a human being has ever said. He said, if you were to stop them from worshiping, the rocks themselves would cry out. Think about that for a moment. Jesus says, if you stop these people from worshiping, even the rocks themselves would worship me. That is not someone shying away from who he is. He's humble riding on a donkey, but he is king. He knows it. And it doesn't matter if anybody else knows it, he knows it and he acts like it and he speaks like it. The Lord has need of it, that's enough. And even if these stopped worshiping, the stones themselves would worship him. You know, it's kind of interesting that almost everyone believes that Jesus actually existed. There's no real debate about that. He is a true historical figure. But a lot of people put him in the category of a prophet or perhaps a teacher or a good man, but not God. When you read this passage, that option is not on the table. C.S. Lewis makes the point this way. You cannot put Jesus in the category of a prophet or a good man or a teacher because of passages like this, the only option you have is he is the son of God, the creator of the universe or a lunatic. I'm quoting a man who is merely a man who said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher he would be a lunatic on level with a man who says he's a poached egg. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. He said the stones themselves would start worshiping him. Power and humility, authority, and meekness, all wrapped up in one person riding on a donkey into Jerusalem. Rejoice greatly. Look, your king is coming to you. He's righteous and victorious, yet he's humble riding on a donkey, and I want you to see that our God, clothed with humility and yet powerful righteousness, has been riding not only into Jerusalem, but into our lives as well. He will whisper to you, he will walk with you, mere human beings, humble enough to walk side by side with you, yet powerful enough to make a difference in all of the significant areas of your life. This is our Jesus riding into Jerusalem, but he's ridden into our lives as well. And as I close this message, we're going to to embrace a time of worship together here this morning. But I want you to see the kind of worship this Jesus inspired. It was outside worship. It's incredible that we gather together in the church and worship in this building. It's a beautiful and awesome, amazing thing to gather together and worship the Lord. But this worship on Palm Sunday was outside of the walls of the temple. And so our worship shouldn't only be expressed in this building. We should be worshiping outside as well. Worship in the car, worship in the office, worship at home, worship in our quiet time, worship at night before we go to bed, worship in the morning when we first get up, everywhere we go, in all of creation, in the walks of our lives, we should be worshiping the Lord. It was spontaneous worship. It wasn't planned. 
We planned this service that we would gather together at 9.30. We'll have another service at 11.30. It's planned and it's wonderful to plan together, to come together. But this worship was spontaneous. And so we should have spontaneous worship in our own lives whenever we feel the inspiration to do so. It was contagious worship. Luke chapter 19, verse 37, a whole multitude lifted their voices in praise. Maybe it started with just a few sincere followers, but it spread perhaps to a million others. Next week, more people will be at church than any other Sunday in the year. I wanna encourage you to worship from your heart, to worship with passion, this humble, powerful Savior coming into our lives. Let our worship be contagious to those who might be coming for the very first time, who will see in our hearts authenticity that stirs and inspires them. It was demonstrative worship. It wasn't just quiet so that nobody else would know. It wasn't a private thing. They were raising their hands. They were dancing. They were bowing down. There were physical actions. I'll never forget going back to the small little United Methodist Church that I grew up in. And we were singing a, a hymn and uh, the, the hymn was, How Great Thou Art. And, and, and people were just singing, but um, Jesus had captured my heart. I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't stop. I just raised my hands and started worshiping the Lord. And my mom told me afterwards that one of her friends uh, was poked by another person in the church saying, man, Kitty's son is sure getting into it. <laughs> the truth is, the worship that we have is demonstrative. It's something that people can see and people go crazy at football games and then come to church and act like the frozen chosen. It was joyful worship. They rejoiced and praised God. There wasn't sackcloth and ashes. It wasn't somber and sober. Some of us need to notify our faces that Jesus is living on the inside of us. It was sacrificial. They laid down their coats. And in some cases that would have been extremely sacrificial. Their worship moved them to generosity. Worship always does that. And it was unstoppable. They couldn't help themselves. The king who created all things was now humbly riding on a donkey to save mankind. The worship was spontaneous, uh, contagious, demonstrative, joyful, sacrificial, and unstoppable. And the Pharisees came up to Jesus, tell them to stop. What they're doing is not right. And Jesus said, you can't stop what's unstoppable. The humble, powerful Savior riding into Jerusalem, riding into our lives. He said, if you were able to stop them, the rocks themselves would cry out. Now, I'm gonna ask you to do something. I hope you hang with me here. I'm gonna ask you, all of us to stand to our feet. Those of you down south, let's all of us stand to our feet. Even if you're home, I want you to stand up. And we're, we're gonna go into a moment of worship, but I wanna close with this story, true story. In 1541, Muslim Turks conquered Jerusalem and the leader of the Muslims, he stoned up the Eastern gate the very gate that Jesus rode in on into Jerusalem, the Eastern gate, he sealed it with stones. I want you to take a look. It still lasts to this day. This is the Eastern gate. It's sealed with stones. Tradition has it that he sealed up the Eastern gate because he heard that Jesus would be coming back. According to Ezekiel, he would be coming back and he would come back through the Eastern gate. 
So he stones up the gate to keep Jesus from coming back without realizing that the very stones that Jesus said would one day cry out and worship were gathered to seal the Eastern gate. They are proclaiming that Jesus is coming back again. They're crying out. And to be totally honest, I don't know what they were thinking because a couple of thousand years earlier, they tried that same thing. They took a stone to seal a grave to keep Jesus in. It didn't work out so well. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That's for next week. Right now, let's worship our humble, powerful Savior. Let's worship Him from our hearts.
according to the calendar, today is Palm Sunday. But I have a sneaky suspicion and actually a deep conviction that for some of us, today is Palm Sunday. See, because Palm Sunday was the day that people cried out and acknowledged, Oh Lord, save us. And maybe you came to this service today and you are in need of a Palm Sunday. You are in need of a moment to cry out to Him and say, Lord, save me. Save me from my sin. Save me from the distance that I feel from You. Save me from the hardship that I'm experiencing. Oh Lord, save me. So if that's you today, if you need a Palm Sunday today, I would encourage you right there where you are, just, I know you don't have a Palm branch or something, but just reach out your palms, reach out your hands and point your palms out to heaven and say, Oh Lord, save me. God, I need you today to come and save me. Thank you, Lord, that you see every hand. Thank you, Lord, that today, just like Jesus rode on a donkey into Jerusalem, you are arriving in the lives of people today. You are making yourself known. You are making yourself present and you are saving people. Lord, thank you that by your blood and through your death on the cross, we are saved and today we can proclaim our Palm Sunday, we can say that, Lord, we believe in you with all our hearts. And from this day on, we will live for you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you made a commitment to Christ today, if you asked Him to come and dwell in you, to come and live in you, if you've given your heart to Him, you can text the word FORGIVEN to the number 97000. We would love to connect with you. We would love to give you some resources that can take you, help you along this journey. I wanna invite the prayer partners to the front. If you have any prayer need today, or if you would just like to pray with somebody about something, or if you responded today, and you would just like to build a monument of prayer today together with somebody, we're ready to stand with you in prayer next week is Easter week. Wednesday nights, we have groups as usual. On Friday night at seven o'clock, we've got an incredibly special Good Friday service. So Easter weekend starts at seven o'clock on Friday night, and then Sunday, 9.30 and 11.30 is our Easter services. Don't forget to text those invites to everybody you know. Can I speak a blessing over you today? From the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. Have an incredible week. See you Wednesday. See you Friday. See you Sunday with all your friends.